Hey guys, Shelby Mathis here, and today we're going to talk about a quote from Warren Buffett concerning some snow and a long hill. And I'm just going to lay out the quote straight up, and then I'm going to kind of graph it out. I want you guys to follow along. But the quote is, life is like a snowball. The most important thing is to find wet snow and a good long hill. What he's talking about there can be summed up in kind of a visual. So I'm just going to use my handy dandy visual here and I'll put myself up in the corner. But if you think about it, you want to talk about a hill and I'm just going to put it over a time horizon. So I'm just going to say that time is down here and the longer time goes and I don't really care what measure of time we use. This could be a hundred years for all I care. Your time on this earth might be this period to this period, right? In other words, if you're going to create a legacy, you need to be thinking in terms of hundreds of years instead of 10, 20 years. And when you start doing that, your activities today change considerably because you're not trying to put so much pressure on yourself to have immediate effect. Like we've all seen people that try to cut corners, do the get rich quick, things like that. It rarely works out. In fact, for the most part, it doesn't. And I'll use the example of stock traders. I've seen a lot of traders lose a lot of money trying to time the market, do short-term things. And there's been studies done on this. And over a 15-year period, in fact, in one of those studies in Taiwan, they tracked day traders and they found that 1% made money. It was just 99% lose money. Yes. My experience here in the United States is that it's probably 80 to 90% from what I see is people that end up losing when they're trying to time the market. It's really tough to do. Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time, not only does he have some pretty good quotes, but he kind of said it. Uh, it's like, hey, if you want to make money and you want to create a legacy, if you want, really, if you want to be a wealthy individual, you only need to find about three stocks three really good companies, and you're probably going to be ahead of the game over, over a long time horizon. You don't have to be the best stock picker. You just have to find really good companies that are profitable and that you're going to own for a long stretch of time. I'm going to call that kind of the wet snow. So I'm going to draw, you know, just we'll just call this wet snow. This is the type of investments that we want to be involved in. We'll just put snow, 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 snow. Here we go. There's a bunch of snow. And what the snow is really to me is long term investments in great companies. So, in I'm going to call them dividend companies. Excuse my writing there for a second. Not the greatest drawer, by the way, but you'll get the point. So, as you're going along and you're doing your investing, uh, a dividend producing company is going to be paying for itself. So if you own a dividend producing company, let's say that it's producing dividends, say 5% a year, 4% a year, something like that. Rule of 72, I could take 72 and divide it by four. So if you don't know what I'm doing here, this is how long it takes it to double. It'll double every 18 years, which means it's paid for itself. It will pay for that self, that company, assuming nothing changes, it never increases its dividend over 18 years. So if you own a stock for 18 years, it's free. It's produced enough revenue at around a 4% rate, but that's not the reality. The reality is that over a long term, you're creating a snowball. That 4% becomes 4.1%, becomes 4.2%, 4.3%, and you see the snowball start to build up. And you might say, well, 4%, 5%, that's not so great. When it relates back, to the original price. So, so let's say that you were really smart and you were like Warren Buffett and you bought Coca-Cola, you know, let's say it was at 30 bucks or something, you know, I, I won't say Coke, I'll just say any company at 30 bucks and it was paying a, a 90 cent dividend. And over time that dividend increases, they increase actually at a rate that's a little bit larger, a little bit faster than the stock market. But let's just say it's, Let's say it's 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 ten percent, seven percent. We'll just use the stock market amount. We won't even do anything. That means that it's doubling about every ten years. That means that in ten years we're at one eighty. In uh, another ten years, in twenty years, we're at three sixty. It's literally 
paying for itself the original investment every 10 years at that point. We're really starting to pick up some steam. And then if you're like Warren Buffett, who bought Coca-Cola, I think it was 1986, you know, fast forward to 2020, and that thing is kicking off, like it's paid for itself already, but it's kicking off a ton of cash. And he doesn't have to do anything. He just sits back. That's why the guy's wealth just exploded from, I think when he became a billionaire, was probably in his 50s. Now he's at 88, 90 billion, probably more than that. Who knows, right? It just keeps snowballing. And that's what I mean by this little guy right here, the snowball. So to a lesser extent, we're going to do the same thing. So we're looking at long-term investments is really great snow. The other thing that is really good snow in wet snow would be cash flow real estate. So I'm going to put real estate dash cash flow. These are rentals that are generating income. In other words, if the, if the price of the real estate goes up and if it appreciates over time, that's a bonus. In all reality, what we're really looking for in both of these situations is income that can compound. These are producing, the asset itself is producing the income. So whether you go to Tahiti, whether you're sleeping at home and taking a vacation or you're going to see your kids or whatever, you just fill in the blank. These things are continuing to snowball without you. You don't have to do anything because we have a nice long hill. Here's our nice long hill. It's called a long hill. And we have good wet snow. So again, I kind of said, here's like, let's just say this was your lifetime. I look out longer because I like to think about a legacy. So if you're going to create a legacy, all you got to do is start it up. But let's be real. We're just going to be talking about you for today. And what we want to make sure of is that we don't have things that fall off and cause a hole. So here's like a hole. Here's a cliff. Oh, no, we don't like cliffs. Here's a cliff. Oh, no, we have good wet snow. And there's these little cliffs that, that, that form. Here's a cliff. Oh, no, right? That could stop us. And your snowball could go right down here, right? And it stops everything. What are those cliffs? And how do we patch up that hole? One of those cliffs is lawsuits. And the way that you address lawsuits, quite seriously, is by putting an asset protection plan in place. An asset protection plan isn't anything magical. It's just putting a box around things. So if I have some cash, let's say that I have cash sitting here and there's me, hey, there's me. And I do something dumb when I'm driving. Let's say that I cause an accident. If they go after me, they can get my cash unless I put a box around my cash. This is called outside liability. I can never stop myself from creating liability. If I drive, I'm creating liability. There's the chance that I hit the young neurosurgeon, you know, who just got their license and has a multi, multi million dollar uh, amount of, of, of earning potential that could just cause them, right? There's nothing I can do to really stop that, but I can insure myself. I could do things like that, but I have to make it to where they can't take my big chunk of asset. Let's say that I buy, and let's just say that I'm a neurosurgeon. That's even good. So I'm Mr. Neurosurgeon or Miss Neurosurgeon, and I'm very, very valuable. And I go buy a rental property because I heard rental property is a good idea. And a tenant falls down and hurts themselves. Ah, uh, now they sue me and they're coming after me, right? I own that piece of property. I'm the landlord. They're coming after me. They could garnish me. They could garnish my wages forever. So how do I do with that? Same situation. I'm going to put a box around it. It's actually pretty simple. So if anything happens inside here, it's trapped inside that box. What is that box? Well, that's an LLC in both of these cases, but it's some sort of entity structure. We're putting something in place to where they can't get out. Like, they, hey, they can get the equity of that one house but they can't come take everything else that I make. I, I used to have this example. Somebody would say, hey, I'm just going to buy a cheap house in Indianapolis. I'm paying 70 grand for it cash. I'm not, you know, what do I care? I'm just going to own it. I'm like, well, what do you make? Well, what do you mean? What do I make? They could, if something bad happens. They're going to garnish you. Oh, they can garnish me? Yeah, but I thought they were just limited to that house. It's only worth 70 grand. Well, they're not limited to the house. No, 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 not unless you isolate it. And so that's our first thing that we do is we put a little bridge across that little guy and say, all right, let's make sure that, uh, that we don't lose 
our snowball as it's building up. So our snowball is able to continue to grow. And we see our snowball getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's our snowball going down the hill. Over the years, this snowball is just sitting there compounding. And I could be adding to it and things like that. But here comes another big gap. And what's this other big gap? This is health and disability. This is something that could absolutely suck up your snowball. So again, how do we how do we control that? How do we make sure that that I'm able to make right decisions? And I'll say like, hey, how do I stop the hospital from preserving me? Like, let's say I was uh, brain dead, horrible situation, right? Let's say that something happened and I was brain dead. How do I stop the hospital from continuing to drain my estate and and and, and kill my snowball? Maybe I want the snowball to go to my kids or to people that I care about? How do I stop it from happening? How do I keep this snowball from going into the hole? You know, here it comes. It's really built up. How do I keep that from happening? Well, again, it's putting a plan in place. It might be as easy as having some insurance. It might be as easy as making sure you have disability insurance, that you have long-term care, that you have a good life insurance policy that you can access during your lifetime, that you can access the death benefit. So this is generally taking care of with some sort of insurance and in combination with an estate plan. And the estate plan that we use is actually called a living trust. And a lot of people get confused because they say, well, living trust, oops, here, I'm going to make my, my face go away so that you guys can actually see this. Sorry. Uh, a living trust, a lot of folks think of it as something that only works when you're dead. And that's not, what a living trust is. A living trust has provisions in it during your lifetime. In fact, the trust is actually in place during your lifetime. And you just have a successor trustee if you're not able to do things for yourself in conjunction with healthcare documents and uh, financial documents and things like that. Like we want a power of attorney for healthcare. We want a power of attorney for health, uh, for, excuse me, for financial healthcare, a living will for end of life decisions. So somebody can advocate for you. And this is going to help us in along with a good insurance policy and making sure that you have good insurance that we're able to keep from losing our snowball. It's continuing to grow. It goes over that guy right there and it's continuing to grow. Now, there's one little problem that we have, and that is that there's this thing called the sun that's out there. And you remember what the sun does. The sun might melt your snowball. All right here. We got a sun. What is that sun going to do? Well, we want to make sure that that sun doesn't come down here and get too much hot, right? Too much heat on this thing. Because all of a sudden, if there's heat, our snowball starts to melt, right? It starts kicking off and chunks fall off and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, the snowball starts to get smaller again, right? Oh no, I'm getting killed with taxes. How do I stop the taxes from affecting it? Well, the easiest thing to do is put a tax plan in place. In other words, be cognizant of it. Just by doing real estate and uh, and dividend producing stock, dividends are actually taxed at long-term capital gains rates. If it's a United States company, it's called qualified dividends. And so what we're really putting in place is a nice little tax umbrella. You know, we'll just call it this. This is our nice little tax plan. And what that's doing is keeping your snowball in the shade, even when it's super hot out, you know. So we still have that sun going down, you know, coming down on us. We just want to make sure that that there's some shade. And this is done via this. I always call this a tax plan. One of you hear attorneys and accountants start talking about putting a tax plan in place. Usually it involves here. I'll get this thing out of the way again. Usually it involves things like, hey, let's make sure that there's retirement plans here. I'll put it over on this side so I can put my face back up. So uh, I'll do it like that. Here we go. So you can see my beautiful artwork. So the tax plan might be retirement plans, which we've all heard of. You have individual retirement arrangements or IRAs. Uh, a lot of you guys call them individual retirement accounts, but it's individual retirement arrangements. 401k, DB plan, et cetera. Hey, I'm putting things in place. I might be using, if I'm more advanced, I might be using 501c3s. Uh, if I'm doing a DB, I might be doing a cash balance. I might be doing deferred sales trusts. I can't, I'm, I'm, my little face is covering it up. So I'll put that deferred 
sales trust, DSTs. Uh, we have things like using a corporation and splitting income to the side, and that could be an S or a C. Um, we have lots of little structures that we could be using. You could be using uh, even certain types of plans like SLATs. Uh, we can be using CRTs, Charter Remainder Trusts. We could be using a Nevada Asset Protection Trust with the state planning provisions uh, where we're, we're freezing and making sure that we don't get hit with any excess taxes. But all of that becomes in the realm of a, of a tax plan. And so we have all these things. So I'm just going to put a tax plan up there. All that stuff comes into your, your plan to make sure that you don't lose um, you don't lose your assets and you don't have them getting uh, fried away by the sun. So we're just protecting ourselves from the sun to make sure that uh, it's not melting our snowball. So it's, that's a pretty good idea right there. So now we've, we've, we've done a whole bunch to cover, and then we have the last big one. What do you think the last big one? The last thing that derails most plants. And uh, if you've guessed death, that's it, right? That's the one that I see catch people the most where they're just not expecting it. They do a die and distribute or they have a state taxes or better yet, they just leave a big mess and their kids fight. And the next thing you know, that snowball goes right into the hole and all that hard work and everything gets eaten away. We don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen. And so these two guys, by the way, the health and disability and the death, these guys really go together. And again, what you're doing here, this is a, an estate plan. Most likely a living trust. You do that and all of a sudden, your estate doesn't die. All these assets, they don't have to be sold. They could stay in the trust. And then we do something called HEMS, Health, Education, Maintenance, and Support for Beneficiaries. We could use a state like where I'm located here in Nevada, where we have a 365-year statute. That's just a starting point. So we could have a perpetual dynasty trust that continues to serve your family and just keeps growing. You don't have to give your money to, to folks. You don't have to give it to your kids. No offense. But the stats don't lie. It's about a 30% chance it's going to last two generations. It's not going to make it. The overwhelming odds are against you. And it's just as simple as giving money to somebody that's not prepared for it, that's in a grieving situation. So for example, mom or dad pass away, mom and dad pass away. They give the assets to the kids. The kids aren't prepared for it. The kids are in shock and brother, sisters, or whatever, start going at each other, or they're just not ready for it, so they do something. I, I use this example. I live in Las Vegas. The casinos are over my shoulder here. If you ever go to, into a casino, you'll realize there's a whole bunch of gift shops all around them, and it's usually really high-end stuff, like it's the Rolex, it's the Chanel, it's Dior, it's Louis Vuitton, right outside the casino, like right around the casino, and you're like, who goes to these? They can't have that much traffic. What happens is if somebody wins money, it's not the same as money that you've earned. When you get an inheritance, invariably people make bad decisions. They do impulse buys. All of a sudden they have money that they haven't had before and they might make a bad decision. If they're prone to uh, uh, addictions, quite often those research. Uh, you make a lot of bad decisions when you're just given a bunch of money that maybe you're not prepared for. And if this is the case and you have this big old um, snowball that's coming down the pike and you give it to somebody that might not be prepared, it's not uncommon for them just to, just to squander it away. Here, I'm going to get rid of that. There. We don't want that. We don't want to be in a situation where we're putting somebody into that situation, our loved ones, or like to where they could squander or that they could be, they could change their lifestyle. Hey, they're going along, they're living a modest lifestyle. They get a couple hundred grand. So what do they do? They go out and they say, oh my gosh, I've never really had a nice car. So they buy a really expensive car. And what they don't realize is with an expensive car comes expensive insurance and expensive oil changes and expensive, expensive maintenance. A tire on a, on, a, on a premium car might be a thousand bucks. And they're used to being able to get four tires for, you know, for a lot less for, for 500 bucks. And now all of a sudden they're getting, you know, it's going to cost them a, a month's wages just to, put tires on it and they didn't realize it and they ended up in a financial peril or they go out and they buy a larger house 
And a larger house has larger utilities, you know, you know, larger repair bills, larger property taxes, all these other things that they didn't anticipate. And two or three years into it, all of a sudden, they don't have that nest egg that you left them. They burn through it because they're spending more because they have all this money burning them down and they can't maintain their lifestyle. And that's why uh, when there's studies done on lottery winners, quite often uh, within five or six years, their risk of bankruptcy goes straight on up. It actually starts to rock it up and it's more than normal. And that's one of the reasons is because you change a lifestyle. If you do not put intention behind your estate plan, that quite often happens and voila, you've just knocked out your snowball, right? We don't wanna kill the snowball. We don't wanna destroy it. We want it to, to continue to go on. Don't wanna be in a situation where we're like, oh shoot, look what I did. I just destroyed my snowball. Here, I wanna destroy this, there we go. So we don't wanna destroy the snowball. We want it to continue on down. And in order to do that, we need that nice little estate plan that either gives an orderly distribution of it, so at least you're not fighting in court, or a lot of people don't realize you can create a legacy pretty easy. You don't have to give away the money. You can just have it there if they need it. And it could be for multiple generations. That's what I'd prefer to see. That's what I say to my clients is like, hey, if you wanna make a legacy, you don't even have to have a huge snowball. You could be way up here. You could be like, oh, I'm late in life. I didn't really get started. But your snowball, if you're doing the life insurance and you're, you're, you're covering these guys right here and you're covering this and you're just putting a plan in place, your life insurance can all of a sudden, if something happens to you, so let's say that you early death, you know, or you pass away, you know, I won't call it early death because you may be starting late and you're saying, my snowball isn't that big. If you have a death and it dumps money in and all of a sudden you have a bunch of cash come in to your, and it gets added to your snowball and there it's compounding it, then all of a sudden your snowball can get going again. And if you have a estate plan that keeps it together, that's all you had to do. I'm always shocked when people say, hey, I went to a lawyer and I talked to the lawyer about doing an estate plan. And they said, oh, you got to just do a simple will, die and distribute. Hey, yeah, yeah. You know, I was looking to go, well, wait a second. Why? Like, hey, will uh, trust is for rich people. And I always equate that to like if you called up an alarm company and you said, hey, it, it, will you come to my house and see about installing an alarm? And the alarm technician comes in, ADT or one of these places, and they come around and they look around your house. They give it a good look, see, and they say, no, 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 you don't need an alarm. What do you mean I don't need an alarm? Yeah, you don't really have much to protect. In fact, you should probably start leaving your doors open. Maybe somebody will drop off some prettier furniture for you. <laughs> you know, could you imagine if they did that? You'd be looking at them like they're from Mars, but somehow we accept it when it's a professional. And they go, oh, you don't need to do this. Yes, you do. Anybody could do it. It's just... It's, it's if you decide not to do it with your eyes open, hey, I'm going to create a situation where the, the overwhelming majority of the time there's going to be an issue. I'm leaving my, a probate for my kids. I'm leaving disputes between my children about money. And I, my family has been through that. My wife's family, there's still a portion of it that won't talk because there's a perception that there was unfairness in a disposition of an, of an estate plan. There wasn't one. And people that were taking care of grandma were mad saying, I'm owed money. There's, there's always an allegation of things are missing and all this stuff. And everybody's fighting because there's a fear. There's this kind of this unfairness. Hey, this isn't fair. I, I, I took care of grandma for, for five years before she passed away and she didn't give me anything. And you're taking everything. This is really unfair. Or the other side of it is, hey, you were living with grandma. I'm sure you were taking money out of her account. You know, and they start doing the point the fingers at it document it and say, hey, neither of you guys are getting anything. There's money there if you guys need it, but it's really for future generations. Let's 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 make sure that the the kids and the grandkids and the great great grandkids and the great 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 grandkids that they have there's money there for their health, education, maintenance and support. Let's make sure that if they get into a school that they have funds there so that they if that's important to you, so that they have college. Or that if there's a medical issue in our our family that we're able to address it. You know, this big guy down here, that there's money there to make sure that they're not suffering or that if anybody's ever suffering from, you know, again, something that might be health related or they're financially struggling or we go through another recession, there's some funds there to make sure people aren't homeless so that there's, they're never, they're never uh, food, uh, you know, they're never hungry or their family's not suffering in that manner or that they don't have transportation or 
all of these things fill in the blank. That's what your trust in a simple act of being very intentional about it can create. But going back to Warren Buffett, he said, hey, long hill, lots of uh, and wet snow. And there was a great, great video of him once talking about 1942 where you're sitting here and he's talking about one of his investments and he bought something and then and the war was going on, the war broke out and it pulled back a little bit and it came back and got back into profit area and he sold it. And he was like, wow, I got out and I didn't lose any money. And then he pointed out that if he had owned that same stock, I, I remember him showing it, it looked like this a little bit. He was like, man, I bought right here and it dropped down here and then it went back up and I sold it right here. I sold and I made, you know, where I bought it, and I made this amount of profit. And he was so happy, right? And then he said, and then that company just kept doing this and this and this, and it just kept shooting up. Here, I'll show it so you can see it. And it kept shooting up. And he was like, man, if I had held that, I would have just, it would have kept going. And it just kept going up and going up. So he ran a number. Ran a little study. If in 1942, in 1942, when that occurred, he had put $10,000 into the Dow, today it would be worth over, get this, what do you guys think it's going to be? It would be worth over $50 million just investing it in the index. That's called wet snow. If you could just wait, in that case, in, in his waiting, what is that, uh, 1942, so that's about 80 years. And within 80 years, you could take $10,000 to $50 million just putting it into something where there's some wet snow, All right? So that's that's over here. You know, that's that's this guy right here. That's our, this is our, our dividend stocks and our real estate and cash flow. If you just stick it in there, and let it accumulate over time, it's going to compound and it's going to be a very large amount of money over time if you just give it that time. And we just got to keep the threats at bay, the big ones, lawsuits, health disability issues, and death. Those are the big ones that we just got to knock off. We do this and we create a little legacy plan so that it's, it's, it doesn't fall into the, the pit of, of, of an estate dispute or gets st stuck in probate for five years or that there's fighting over it or you give it to somebody who's not prepared for it, that snowball just keeps coming off. It just keeps growing, just keeps growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And then if we look at it on a time horizon and we really start going out there oops, and we start looking at it over a longer term, you start realizing that, uh, oops, there we are. Uh, you start realizing that you could have a major, major nest egg, this big snowball after a long period of time. And if you can do it over multiple generations, it even gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it can all start with you. You just have to put a plan in place. It's not that difficult. It's actually fairly simple. It's just being very intentional about it. What I would say to people that are getting started, 10% into your investments every month, pay it like it's a bill. Find good companies that are paying out dividends in, on Infinity Investing. We always have a list. You can always go in there and check it out and see which companies. We rate them on a scale of one to seven, and we use third-party rating services to rate it safety scores. And then people are looking at it, and then you can always teach you the seven criteria as well, and you can kind of go through and say, when's the timing right on things? And you just start buying it. Here's good stuff. This is a good deal right now. There's usually two or three of them to start accumulating over time. Or if you like really, if you have companies that you really love, like, yeah, hey, I love Starbucks, I love Costco, I love Home Depot. When I drive, I, when I drive home, I hit a Chevron, right? If there's companies like that, hey, I use AT and T on my phone, or I use Verizon, buy those companies. If they're like I just mentioned, every single one of those is paying out dividends, I believe. Walmart, I love going to Walmart. You know, great, they pay out a great dividend. I go to Lowe's instead of Home Depot. Great, look at it, probably pays out a great dividend. Buy those awesome companies and just keep buying them. There's no such thing as time in the market. Just keep buying them and then be patient. Over time, you will snowball. It's not rocket science. And all you have to do is say like, hey, I'm going to take 10% of my take home. I'm going to start putting it in there. 
If you have no debt, make it 20%. If you have debt, take 10% and pay down your debt after you pay your, your whatever you're paying as part of your normal budget. Put an extra 10%, and knock that thing out. And then make sure you have 10% that you're giving away or doing good things with for others. And that leaves you with 70% that you can live off. It's actually really simple. You just live off of 70% of whatever you bring home, put 10% into investments, 10% towards debt, 10% into giving. If you're not a big giver, put that extra 10% into your investments. If you have no debt, put that extra and you're putting 30% of your take-home pay into investments. You're going to have a snowball that gets really big a lot sooner. And then once you start seeing that thing start to grow, shelter it from taxes, make sure that sun doesn't melt it, right? And you're going to be really surprised at the results that you get over a long period of time. Put a nice little asset protection plan in place so nobody gets your snowball. As it gets bigger and bigger, people are going to start getting envious of your big snowball. So make sure that there's some, some protection in place. Make sure that things that could happen to you, hey, I get, you know, I have a health scare or I end up in the hospital for a period of time. Make sure that you have good insurance. Make sure that you're doing things like uh, index universal life or whole life or something where there's a cash value that you can access. If you have a disease that there's nothing you can do about, hey, I have terminal cancer, there's not much I can do about, you can access your death benefit of your insurance ahead of time so you're not draining your estate. If something happens to you and, you know, again, you're not, you're not going to recover and you say, hey, you know what, don't keep me in this situation. I don't want to be in a vegetative state. Please pull the plug. Make sure that you're empowering somebody to do that. It's going to keep your snowball. That way they're not draining your snowball. They're not melting it down. They're not eating all your snow, right? And if you do those simple things, you're going to get fantastic results. How do I know? Because I see it every day. We have thousands of clients around the country. I get to do tax returns. Our firm does over 10,000 tax returns a year. I get to see who makes money all the time. I've been doing this for over, I think it's close to 25 years, Anderson, 23 years. We've been watching this. My, my partner and I, this is, this is what we do. I have a ton of properties. I get to see who is successful and get what they do. They do it systematically over a long period of time. Every study of wealthy people bears that out. That statistically speaking, it's always the engineers and the CPAs and the teachers that seem to be the wealthiest over time. Why is it? Because they understand those principles of just, hey, I'm going to live off a little bit, me, you know, a, a, a little bit more modestly. They're not the big bankers. They're not big, high rolling lawyer, doctor, although those guys are in the top 10. But the top categories for people that are that are millionaires is the people that seem to understand numbers and understand being students and not living large. Those people are all fairly conservative. They're not using their money to show how much money they have. They use the money to make more money and it compounds a lot faster. And that's what we want to do. You want similar results? Do what they do. Go find that long hill and some wet snow. <laughs>